And the reason is, my, this is my interpretation, people were raised with the second ethical system in the Soviet Union. In order to cope with the West, they need to learn the first ethical system. They need to make that transition. Each individual needs to make that transition in order to understand democracy and free markets. But in order to do that, they have to understand the two systems of ethical cognition and learn how to engage in reflexive control. So that this is the theory that's being used in education and in psychotherapy in Russia now to help the people make the transition. Okay. Now the next reflexive control theory, uh, reflexive theory that I want to cover is George Soros' work. Now probably everybody here has heard of George Soros, right? Most people have. He's an extremely successful investor. Uh, he made a great deal of money uh, in the stock market, currency markets, and so forth. And then he proceeded to give it away. Uh, he was financing the transitions in Eastern Europe from the very beginning of those transitions. So he was giving money to Solidarity. He was giving money to Charter 77 in the Czech Republic. Uh, he was putting Xerox machines in libraries in Hungary. Very revolutionary activity at the time because uh, uh, you may or may not know about something called the Sami's Dot. The Sami's Dot was uh, um, illegal literature. So, for example, uh, Solzhenitsyn's novels uh, would be passed from person to person and people would retype them on manual typewriters with several carbon copies. And, uh, and that was the way Solzhenitsyn's work was reproduced and distributed in the Soviet Union uh, uh, in, in the period under Khrushchev and Brezhnev and so forth. Well, if you have a copier, that really simplifies the reproduction of literature uh, in these formerly authoritarian uh, societies. So Soros both put copiers in libraries and then when the internet became available he was hooking up Russian universities to the internet. And he did many other things. Uh, but he was very clever and very strategic in his efforts to undermine uh, the communist system and then to build up civil society after communism collapsed. Now my feeling is that Soros's theory is quite compatible with second order cybernetics and the other system sciences, but he's not an academic. So he uses little of the language of cybernetics and system science. But nevertheless, the match to me is very clear. And what he does is he connects second order cybernetics to economics, finance, and political science, which had not been done by the cyberneticians before. Before the cyberneticians had made connections to engineering, psychology and family therapy, management, and philosophy of science, but not economics, finance, and political science. So his contributions are really quite important, I think. But his theories are not yet well known in systems and cybernetics community, and they're not yet highly regarded by economists and finance professors. Uh, and I'll explain why, I think. Okay, Soros has a, a participatory, not a purely descriptive theory of social systems. And in fact, he rejects Popper's conception of the unity of method. Popper studied, excuse me, Soros studied with Popper at the London School of Economics when he was a student in the 50s. And he adopted Popper's idea of open society for his foundations so that he, he's created a series of open society foundations, I think almost 50 of them now, in countries around the world promoting the development of civil society or open societies. But what Popper claimed was that you could use the same method for the physical sciences and the social sciences. Namely, the method of conjectures and refutations. Uh, that is, you create a theory of the system and you attempt to disprove it. Uh, the reason why you create knowledge in this way is because of the problem of induction. 
The problem of induction is the problem that you cannot reach general knowledge through inference. The standard example is sw white swans. If you've seen a lot of swans, and all the swans you've seen are white, you can form the conclusion that all swans are white. But one day you may see a black swan, and in fact there are black swans, okay, just like there are albino human beings. Okay, they, they're rare, but they're there. As soon as you see a black swan, that disproves your proposition that all swans are white. And that's the problem of induction that no matter how many cases you have seen that fit a description, the next case you see may disprove that proposition. Hence, all scientific knowledge is tentative. All scientific knowledge is provisional if it's based on induction. The only certainty you can have, the only certainty you can have is if with deductive knowledge, where you start off with a set of axioms that you accept, like the law of requisite variety, and deduce propositions from that. That can be certain because the logic is certain as long as there's no self-reference involved. Now, Popper pointed this out. Popper pointed out the problem of induction and said that then in order to distinguish scientific thought from non-scientific thought, every proposition must be testable. So you first uh, create an, uh, a theory and then you test it. And if you fail to disprove it, you accept it tentatively. That's the notion of conjectures and refutations. But Popper also claimed that you could create a theory of social systems in the same way that you create a theory of physical systems. And Soros says no because social systems are fundamentally different. In social systems, there's observation and participation. Uh, let me give an example that came up just very recently. Uh, you may or may not know that there's something called feng shui in China, which is a set of ideas about the appropriate design of a house. I know very little about this but one of my Chinese doctoral students said that the idea is that if your house is designed in accord with feng shui, then the people who live in it will be happy and prosperous, okay? And if you have a house that's designed not in accord with the principles of feng shui, then the people will be unhappy, they will be troubled, and they will be not economically prosperous. Now, when I heard that explanation, which may or may not be correct, my immediate reaction was, aha, a testable proposition. So in other words, you go around and you look. You say, okay, who, who lives in a feng shui house? Who lives in a non-feng shui house? Are they happy? Are they prosperous? You can test the proposition. But the way you test it in China may be different from the way you test it in the United States because the people who live in the United States have never been told that you should live in a house that is built in accord with feng shui. Whereas in China, if people are told that you should live in a house that's designed in accord with feng shui and they do not live in such a house, then they may be unhappy because they have been told that they should live in a house built in accord with feng shui. This is reflexivity, okay? If, if you're told one thing and experience is not in accord with it, you may be unhappy. If you're never told that, that proposition may not affect your thinking at all. And what Soros is saying is this phenomenon does not occur in the natural sciences. Now, how are we to understand Soros's theory? I suggest two contextual ideas are useful. The first is Carl Mueller's epigenetic theory. This was that theory that I explained to you before about genotype and phenotype. Variety occurs at information or pattern. Selection occurs at organism or organization. And I explained that to you before. Now here's a modification of it. Let's say you have an idea. You then try to get people to accept the idea. 
you get a support group. If you get a sufficient group supporting the idea, maybe you can get legislation passed, or you can start up a small business, which has some effect within society. You can then measure the effect within society and generate a new idea. So my claim is that you can understand social change as a matter of inventing ideas, trying to get acceptance, acting upon them, measuring the effects, and inventing a new idea. It turns out that academic disciplines have a tendency to define systems in different ways. Some describe systems as collections of variables, which we discussed earlier, physics and economics among them. Some describe systems as sequences of events. Computer science or history would be an example. Some fields talk about groups, sociology, political science, coalitions. Some fields talk about ideas, psychology, philosophy, cultural anthropology. You can also have an interaction between ideas and society, and I'll show you that in a moment, which is a combination of ideas and events. The claim is, that's how social systems change. Here's an example of the interaction between ideas and society. That's like interest in trade and ancient learning leads to Marco Polo's trip, which brings science and technology stimulated by desire to improve trade. So traders accumulate wealth, nation states developed. Then you have the idea of progress, because people see that things are changing and improving. So people strive to progress more. You have an industrial revolution, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, capital accumulation, Marx and Engels, etc. So you can trace out a sequence of, of events between ideas and events. And you can look at the change in social systems in that way. Soros calls this a shoelace model, which I thought was quite clever. If you use all of these methods for describing a social system, then I believe you get a richer description of the social system, and you're less likely to overlook important considerations and you're likely to use the theories and methods of more than one discipline. These are specific advantages. You're more likely to include the interests of uh, additional groups. Uh, you're more likely to think about culture, beliefs, and values. Uh, actions to produce change are likely to be considered, and then you can have measurable variables. Classical scientific theories tend to emphasize variables and ideas. This is what I'm saying here. Certainly economics and finance. They build mathematical models. And depending upon those models, you may come up with an idea, which you then have to sell to the politicians in order to implement in policy. But that's considered outside the domain of economics and finance. What economics and finance professors do is build mathematical models. That's not what Soros is doing. Soros analyzes a system using all of these methods. If you read his book, Alchemy of Finance, you'll see that he uses all of these methods when describing some particular financial situation. And reflexivity is the process of shifting back and forth between the description of the social system and participation in the system. Soros sees himself as engaged in a human player game. He's not creating mathematical models. He's playing a game in which he is one of the participants. Other participants are people like the head of the Federal Reserve Board or the Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain, uh, major banks, etc. So according to Soros, you have the cognitive function and the, and the participating function you have a prevailing bias, or you might call it a preconception, and say the underlying trend of a stock price. Now, the interesting thing about economics is that they have this proposition called the efficient market hypothesis, which basically says that information has no value, which is a very surprising conclusion 
given the number of